Hey, welcome. Um, we're really excited to have Travis Moore here today because you've probably seen us at all the meetings, but we only get Travis once or twice a year because he is busy in Tallahassee with all of our representatives. So before we get started giving the, you the who, what, why, where, what's changed and what you have to do, I want to let everybody introduce themselves and go ahead and let Travis give us some background on the actual law itself. So you want to start with Phil and then Jason and then Travis, you can kind of give us that background and introduce yourself then. Sure. I'll kick it off. Uh, so Phil Massey, Assured Partners, uh, Community Association Insurance. Um, expert, we try to consider ourselves. So 20 of us here in our Lake Mary office, 21 actually, myself and my partner, Nagar Sharifi, handle about 1,500 now condo associations around the state of Florida. Uh, so we are spread all over. i uh, got a, a big book of business on the community association side. Try to stay on top of all of these things as they're brewing through CAI and, and with Travis. And I was on the Florida Surfside Task Force and, and all of that from the beginning to try to help shape what we can uh, for our clients. I also have my CIRM designation, which stands for Community Insurance Risk Management Specialist. Only eight of us in the state of Florida and about 100 around the country, um, myself and my partner Nagar, are both, um, both CIRM. So only a, only a few specialty agents uh, that, that handle that. Uh, so looking forward to this. There's a lot. I mean, we'll get into it as we, we go in through this situation uh, and through the webinar, but a lot of good stuff here. Very important and good you're on here. Thank you. President, Jason. Uh oh, oh, is Jason frozen? <laughs> Jason's probably frozen. All right, let's kick it to you. Why don't you go, Tara, and then we'll see if Jason gets back live. Well, hi, everybody. My name is Tara Stone. Um, Valerie Bender is on with us as well. She's going to be handling the chat. So if you have any questions, you can go ahead and write it there. Um, throughout the presentation, the great thing about Zoom webinars is you can come on and ask your question. Don't worry, your face will not show up. It will just be your voice. And we'll be handling that towards the end. We have a lot of information to get through quickly. So um, we're going to be rocking and rolling. I'm the CEO of Stone building solutions. We're a full service engineering and architectural firm. We also do reserve studies, appraisals, um, damage claims, wind valuations. The whole idea is when we come to your property, we um, one inspection, five reports. I've been in this condominium space since um, and insurance since 1999. So I'm giving away my age here. And we have a lot of information and we're certainly excited to help you. And I forgot to mention one thing for me and Travis. So Travis has to jump off um, around 1130 for another meeting and I'm off at 1145. So you see us disappear towards the end of this. It's just because we're slamming everything in kind of a one day. So sorry, I meant to mention that. Uh, thanks, Phil. And thank, thanks all of you for uh, participating with, with this chapter, with the CAI chapter there in Central Florida. It's very, very, you're a vital, vital piece of of the public advocacy work that we all do um, without you and, and the interaction you have in your communities and with your policymakers um, there in, in Central Florida and beyond doesn't really happen. Um, I know that I've, I've pulled you know Phil into, gotten really picked his brain on a lot of information regarding insurance and have been able to apply that directly to some policy stuff that we've worked. So thank you. Thank you, Rini, for the, for the work you do, organizing everything with the chapter. Um, it's invaluable. Um, real quick, as, as, as Tara said, let me just kind of give some, some background overview, and then you guys are the, the subject matter experts, and you can kind of get into the, into the weeds, um, of, of 154. Um, as you all know, we had the Surfside disaster. Um, I think the, the one thing that I, that I need to kind of really impress upon you is that the changes that, that have come from that, um, are not going away. Um, Surfside was the third worst building disaster in the history of the United States um, behind 9-11, the Oklahoma City bombing, and then Surfside. And as, as we all know, the first two were caused by, you know, acts of terrorism. So this is the worst building disaster in the history of our country where, where a building literally fell down. And you cannot have um, a building fall down and 98 people die at 122 in the morning while they're just in their beds um, and not expect that there's gonna be a, a reaction. Um, the reaction initially, um, I, I think was, um, 
uh, was uh, uh, it was drastic. Um, it was one of these things that you know was was going to be very new to um, certainly 67 counties. I mean, I'm sorry, 65 counties of the state. We had two counties that did building inspection type things, Miami Dade and Broward, but certainly nothing else. You know, we have the Florida Building Code, which deals with building building construction and new buildings. But there was no requirement for an engineer to go walking through your building. Um, you know, after that, uh, aside from, like I said, those two counties. So the things that came about from 4D um, and then 154, the the while there be will be some some tinkering, and as there was, you know, 154. We, you know, the, these stakeholders that that we have, that you have, the experts you have with you today, you know, we identified some things that certainly were not going to be workable with 4D, and so then we ended up with um, one 154, which the the governor signed at the end of um, of June. It became law immediately upon upon that signature. Um, there'll be those types of tweaks and and modifications and things to make to clarify what the intent was and to make it workable. But I just, I, I don't want either, either, you know, board members, unit owners, managers, those of all of us that serve and work in community associations to think, oh, you know, this is like the sprinkler retrofit thing, um, which is, you know, taken 20 years and they keep moving it down. Th this is all going to change and we're not going to need to do this. Um, it, you're going to need to do this. Um, and, and, and waiting is not an option. Um, so um, I, I just want to put that out there. Then we certainly will go through the, the, um, the, the, you know, the particulars, but I just feel that we need to be listening with that kind of uh, an attitude that this isn't, oh, you know, as a, like when I was a, a kid, well, you know, mom and dad set this rule up now, but they're going to forget about it. And it's going to go away. I'll just wait them out because that's not going to happen. So just get used to this new environment because this will be the environment that we need to be involved in. And the, the last thing I'll say to that is, had this been, had this happened in a, in a, in a building such as a, a hotel where there's centralized decision-making um, in, in one ownership. So let's just say it's a Marriott. Um, they would have just, you know, the, the, the maintenance issues that showed up, they would have said, you know what, we're going to raise the nightly rate to 289 a night from 189 a night. If you want to stay on the beach here in Miami, people would have paid it. They would have taken the money. They would have maintained the building. Nobody would have would have blinked an eye. But when you're dealing with a building, you know, it's just, just easy math. Let's say 100 owners. And now all of those maintenance decisions have to be made by 100 different people. And they all have you know, a say it it's, this is, you know, it's one of these things where if you're, it's like the Swiss family Robinson, you got to take care of your unit. Sure. But your unit's only as good as the tree that it's in. Um, and you got to take care of that whole tree for your tree house. So that's where we are. I think it's important to, to get this information so that you can get with the professionals, get them to your properties and then and then um this is something that you're not going to just be able to kind of forget about or hope that you know these legislators that don't know what they're talking about are going to forget about it and change it and two things to add to that uh, for one jason did text me he's going to get back on here in a minute his internet went out at his place he apologizes but internet or but jason is um a community association attorney uh, popular, uh, especially in this area in Central Florida, does a great job. So he'll jump on uh, when he can. But just to piggyback on what Travis said from the insurance perspective, anybody who everybody knows, obviously, insurance is a big problem right now. We have plenty of webinars and issues going over that subject matter. But one of the things that we said early on when this first broke post Surfside, whatever ultimately was required by the state to be done, the insurance carriers, specifically the property insurance carriers, are going to require to see these reports in order to quote the insurance. We knew that was coming, and that's absolutely hitting and happening now. So uh, we knew this from the Miami, from Broward and Dade, where we would have to provide the 40-year recertification to get quotes. Now, the 30-year phase ones, which we'll get into and stuff, they are absolutely requirements that we are going to have on the insurance end that once they become law and they should be done by the association, if the association does not have it done, it is going to make getting insurance 
insurance problematic if they have it done and it shows there's issues that the association either hasn't done or hasn't gotten around to being able to provide a timeline for it will be problematic so we already know insurance is extremely expensive um, it is not going to be better for associations that don't do the the phase one inspections and, and follow through with what needs to be done just want right. to add that Bill, that's that's an excellent point because I, I was in the, this this town hall meeting in Miami uh, and and one in Broward um, earlier this week, and Senator Bradley, one of the 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 you know the the sponsor of Senate Bill One Fifty Four, she said exactly that. She was saying, in, in by way of introduction, it wasn't just the legislature and the public that saw what happened that day on on you know the news that went around the world. It was the you know the private sector insurance the 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 you know the lending in, uh, institutions banks um, you know everybody saw what happened and so they were already going to start to be asking exactly those quite you know what uh, lenders now you know what's what are the reserve what's the financial picture what are the what are your reserves you know inspection issues all of that so th th this was something that was going to happen. Um, and it's just, I think the legislature made it, you know, kickstarted it and said, well, this is now the law and you're going to have to do it. So. You guys perfectly. I always talk about the why. And we talk about, I have three pillars of society. I was told this a long time ago that insurance, banking, and politics rule the world. One of those three things. And I said, well, what about real estate? And they said, well, you can't get real estate without a loan. You can't get a loan without a bank. A bank's not going to get it without insurance. And who regulates those is the politics. And just in this brief discussion, we've kind of touched on that. And as unit owners, and what Travis was, was hitting home on, with the example of the tree was the fact that the unit owners care about the granite in their kitchen. They care if their bathrooms are remodeled. They care about the color of the paint. But when it comes to the portion of the roof, the pavement, the waterproofing that they own, they don't necessarily want to fork out those funds because when they sell that unit, it's really a, up to this time, it's been about the granite in the bathroom and not necessarily the structure of the building. And that's really changed in this, this bill, um, Senate Bill 154. It put a lot of teeth in when it comes to the disclosures, things that you have to disclose to buyers and the banks are going to want to see. And if you can't get a loan or that the unit is unfinanceable, it's going to drive down the value of the unit. So what we're telling unit owners and what managers really need to be speaking about is, well, who's going to regulate this? The banking market is going to be the one to regulate it. Because if you can't get a loan to sell that unit, then all of a sudden the value of your unit is way down. Um, we've had a lot of questions. And since you have to cut off early, Travis, I want you to address financing because we know that we talked in the upcoming sessions that it's not going to be about extending the dates or making this law go away. But we've spoken in the past that the legislature will be talking about possible financing options. We've already had about three or four questions of that. Can you touch on that before we get started on the details? You're on mute. There we go. Sorry. Um, yes, I think um, certainly next session already um, the the focus and by next session to put that in perspective, um, committee meetings will start in September and, and the, the legislative session starts in, in June this year and will be done in March. So, we, you know, we're not talking a long way off. Um, the focus is going to be on the financing of this and nobody's nobody's really arguing we don't want safe buildings. They're saying, yeah, we, we want safe buildings, but how do we pay for it? So they're looking at all types of um, things from j just a straight up statewide um, low interest loan pool um, modeled after what Miami Dade um, had. Um, they had a, it wasn't a lot of money and it went very quickly, but they had a loan program for these types of things. Um, there's, there's this argument with the legislature of, we don't want to just give associations money that 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 may not have been good actors let's say and that have just been waiving reserves for 20 years and have not done financially not been keeping up with what needs to be done with their buildings and then to the detriment of you know well we're just going to take care of that for you and catch you up to the detriment of those that have been doing the right thing and, and have been reserving properly so um 
but there are, but they are looking at an, a, a, a low interest, actually a zero interest loan program um, uh, to help. Um, they're looking at things similar to like the PACE program, which is a, a program that is used. Um, the best example is right now, if you're going to try to go to say a street's going from a septic to sewer, um, they don't go down the street and say, okay, you can pay. Okay. You can't pay the $36,000. So we skip your house. We go, you can pay, you can't pay. They just do the whole thing. Um, and then if you can't pay, they put it as part of your tax your property tax, the, the interest payment. So you're paying a little bit every year on your property tax. Um, and then when it becomes a lien so that when you sell your property, um, they, the, 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 30, the 36,000 that's still owed, um, whatever still owed on that, let's just use that as the number, um, is then, is then paid. Um, they're looking at things saying, you know, that where you've got the 87 year old lady who's got plenty of equity in her unit, but she doesn't have um, she doesn't have a job. So she can't get a loan from the bank. Um, so they're saying and she doesn't have the cash to write a, a check to say, OK, if there's if there's repairs that need to be made because of the milestone inspection. And let me just say, you know, the milestone inspection that we're going to talk about here, that's for to determine the 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 safety of your building right now, if there's things that come out of that that say, uh, you got to get this repaired, um, that's not the time where you're setting up a, you know, a 12 year reserve schedule. That's something that has to be done now. So that's where this, the, the, the loans and the cash, if you don't have any reserves to, to, to do it and you need that influx of, of capital, um, they're looking at, well, how do we get that then as, as a loan that becomes a lien on the unit as well? Um, all kinds of different things that are being looked at. So financing um, is absolutely, that's a great question because that is something that's going to be um, on, on, that's top of the list of all the things that they'll be looking at for this year. And we also have the House, um, the the Debbie Wasserman Schultz making condos safer and affordable act. But that's on the federal side, on the on the federal House of Representatives. So I don't know that was just presented and CAI is backing it in, in June, but that was supposed to get a uh, low interest loans uh, for uh, community associations that's their condos nationwide uh, that need it for structural stuff. Um, again, don't know all the details on that one yet, but that's kind of brewing out there as well. And it was some interesting facts, you know, 145,000 condo buildings in the United States, two thirds of them are older than 30 years. So it's like, I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there and the state of Florida has similar um, uh, numbers as well we can go through, but I mean, it's an issue. So I think the biggest takeaway from what Travis is saying, there might be opportunity there, but you're going to have to be ready. You're going to have to have your milestone. You're going to have to have your SIRS. These things are going to need to be done before you're even eligible to get in line for this money. What happened in Miami, he talked about the money going quickly. They opened up the program and it was closed before people could even be organized. So if there is going to be funds available, it would be our suggestion as a panel to have your ducks in a row. So come end of session in spring, next year, if they roll things out in the summer, you're right at the beginning of the line for that money if it does become available. So I'm going to go ahead and get started on the material and share my screen. While you're doing that, Tara, because I know you're going to mention it here about the can insurable the value. Thing? Yeah, I can see the whole thing. So this is the way you want it. But like you're talking about the insurable value appraisals is another piece of this. I mean, all these things when it comes to the insurance side, what we can do for community associations when they have their ducks in a row and have all these things done uh, versus associations that are behind the eight ball. It's a huge, drastic difference. Um, there was one question, Phil, that came up that somebody asked that, are you seeing insurance company asking for any reports like this on a two-story condo? Um, we're able to push so far. Yes, there's been asks for it, but we've been able to push back on that because we know the statute and we go back to them and say it's not required on the two stories. And 
then no one's come back to us and said, well, we're still not going to quote it. We've been able to, to educate them. I've got it. I had it last year where someone asked for the 40 year recertification on a building I have in Winter Park here that was built in the 60s. And I'm like, that's a law that only applies to two counties, not this county. So our job as agents to know the laws, to be able to push back. And so we would push back on that. And I have not seen anybody force that on a two story building. So, um, Really quickly, we're going to talk anything that has a little asterisk by it is something that has changed. There's two pieces of the law, and there's a lot of confusion when you hear structural integrity or SIRS, people get it confused with milestones. The milestone is only the visual inspection of how your building is now. Is it safe? What is the direct actions that you need to take? The SIRS, which is the second piece, has nothing to do with the milestone, is a funding plan to make sure the association has money over the next 25, 30 years to address these issues that come up. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about is the actual milestone inspection. It is a structural visual inspection of the load bearing walls and primary structural members done by a licensed architect or engineer um, or their team and coordinated by them. It is to attest to the life safety of the building. And what it's not for is to say that your building is up to code. So we don't want you to worry like if your railing is not 100% perfect or let's say the pad walking off the stairs or your sprinkler system isn't up to code that that's going to trigger a phase two. What's going to trigger a phase two is things that could cause the building to fall down or as the law describes, substantial structural deterioration. Is this safe? Is someone gonna walk up the stairways with a couch and are those stairs gonna collapse underneath them? Is there water intrusion coming behind the stucco and the eaves that's going to, a whole building is rotted that's hiding behind the facade? These are things that we're seeing every day in the field. And really the United States as a whole is getting aging. We're not see just seeing this with condominiums, we're seeing it with bridges and other major structures. Um, condominiums, like we talked about, have to be addressed because they're not privately owned and they have different financial incentives. Um, but it's just things are aging. And the one thing that we're going to keep touching on today and is that preventative maintenance is 30 times less the cost than corrective maintenance. So in five years from now, after everybody has gone through this process and has their SERS and has their funding in line, the idea is as we continue to manage properties and own properties in the future, we're not going to be looking at these same, same struggles and costs because we're going to be doing the preventive maintenance that needs to be done. And can I say that's like the biggest thing anyone can say to any of these boards? And, and you guys know me that, that do know me. I sat on four large condo boards on two right now. And one of which we had to take through a $10 million reskin due to prior boards not paying attention to, to simple uh, preventative maintenance. Preventative maintenance is tough sometimes. Like, oh, we got to pay what to paint this building or we have to do this or do that. And you find reasons to delay it or not do it. But I promise you, just like Tara said, it costs so much more down the line when there's tons of wood rot and you got to reskin or reside because you just didn't properly maintain the building exteriors. You didn't replace your roof on time and water has been coming in for a long period of time and getting down the siding. The, the cost of those repairs are just catastrophic. I mean, you talk about needing 10 million versus needing a few hundred grand. It, it's just the biggest thing we could get across to folks is don't wait. It always costs more. Surfside was a great example. That number exploded versus what they could have done it for several years before versus what that final contract was prior to that thing coming down. I'm, I'm getting messages that the chat is disabled. So I'm trying to figure out how to turn that on really quickly. Or... Tara, I can go ahead and interject here. So there are two sections for Zoom. There is the webinar chat, which is at the bottom of your screen with the big bubble. That is where everyone can see the content. If you're submitting your questions through the Q&A section, then everyone will not be able to see that. So if you're actively using the webinar chat, everyone can see the questions and we'd happy to get them answered. But if you are using that Q&A section, then you're not gonna be able to see the questions submitted. Yeah, we'll be Valerie will be able to see them, but not necessarily everybody that's um, as a participant. So, um, can, I, can I just mention one thing before I have to dash? Please on the on that 
previous uh, the slide. Um, yes, um, it's a, a licensed engineer and architect, but in keeping with how you guys, as licensed engineers and architects, operate in the in the world with uh, being in responsible charge, um, it can be a member of your of your team. Um, can go out and do it. That was a difference that was made between 4D and 154. Um, you know, when they we 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 now it's kind of expanded that universe a little bit. While it 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 the actual physical that phase one inspection could be done by someone that is a member of that professional design team, but it's just that. But but correctly that the signature and the seal and the license and the approval has to be done under that engineer or architect's license. And um, liability. Right. So, but they'll be the one under responsible charge, which is the, that term of art. Um, we, we don't have to worry anymore about what, where you are in relationship to the, to the coast that's gone um, on seven, that snail mail thing. Um, the whole entire thing does not have to be sent via snail mail. It's just the, the executive summary, which has to be done by whoever does the, the inspection, that licensed engineer or architect, their firm. Um, you know, we, we didn't want, uh, originally it was, oh, you know, the board can just come up with an executive summary. And I said, no, 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 no. I don't want, I, I love my boards, but I don't want Edith, uh, you know, in, in, you know, Brickle Place too, to go through a big report and decide what's important and what's not and come up with her executive summary. Um, so it's got to be done by, but I also didn't want them, you know, the, the association to have to mail you know, something that could be, uh, you know, a hundred pages or something if it, you know, the entire report. Um, uh, the, I did, just uh, the little quirk on the, on the dates. Um, if you turn 30 before July 1st, 2022, then you got to do it by December 31st, 2024. If you turn 30, if your building's 30th birthday party is between July 1, 2022 and December 31st, 2024, you are given until December 31st, 2025. Again, I don't advise anybody waiting, but, you, but and the reason we did that was because we didn't want somebody's building to turn 30, say in December 1st of 2024, and then only now have 30 days to go and get this done. So they're, they are, they're, that little group is the only group that's given on the milestone expe, uh, inspection a little bit more time. Um, I just wanted to mention those things on that slide because now I have to go to the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission meeting that's meeting in St. Pete with a client of mine. So unfortunately I got a, I got a dash. Thomas, thank you for jumping in and letting people know that there is a light at the end of the tunnel and financing. And more importantly, thank you for fighting for us. And um, at CAI, I know that your involvement in the back end, it, it makes such a difference, guys. What Travis does is so important for us because he's really representing the views of managers and unit owners across the state of Florida. And there's a lot of us in Florida. It's not like other states. The condos are a big market and we have to be served. So we appreciate all that you we do. We have now, yeah, we have more now than any other state. We passed California. So we have more than any other state in the country. Um, so yeah, it's a big, it's a big deal. So I know Valerie and 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 you and and Phil, you have my email address. So if anybody need, you know, has a question or anything and and needs me, you know, get a hold of, of you guys and you can send it to me via email and I'll be happy to call or answer it that way. Right. Thank, thank you, Travis. Travis. All right. Thank you guys. Sorry. I have to dash. Talk to you no later. Problem. Bye. Um, so guys, the, a couple changes, if you see the asterisk, it's only residential condo. So we don't deal with that as much in central Florida, but if you think about down in Miami, they might have a shopping mall on the bottom and condos on the top or an airport on the bottom and condos on the top. So it's only the residential condo portion. Like Travis said, 25 years is gone. It's 30 across the board, but the government can shorten or extend it. Why would they extend it? Think about Fort Myers, those people down there 
they don't even have roofs that got ripped off by Ian. So why do they need to spend money on a milestone inspection right now? And then on the flip side, we're you're hearing Broward is talking about making it 25 years across the board instead of 30. So they are judge and jury. The city can do what they want and they can enforce what they want. And this law gave them that um, teeth to do it. Once you do it, you have 10 years. Every 10 years, you have to do another one. Um, and we're really, this law is all about transparency. So we're going to see it in different themes. The first theme that it shows up is right here, how it has to be sent out. Like Travis indicated, only the summary. So for example, at Stone Building Solutions, our summary is just all text and all of our photos are in the non-summary part. So you don't have to use colored ink to print all these pictures along the way. Um, so you have to send it four ways. The first is snail mail. It has to go to every single person and electronic. So if they have electronic, doesn't mean you can't send it snail mail. It has to go both. Um, and it has to go to every address that they actually have listed with you. You have to post it on site and you have to put it on your website if you're required to have one or you, if you have one. And then your engineer of record will submit that as well to the building officials so they have a copy. So you're essentially airing your dirty laundry, right? It's up for everyone to see every bank that gets a loan. It's also required as part of the disclosures. So you really want to be talking with your engineer to make sure they're not putting things in there that aren't necessarily um, needed or required by the law. Uh, we don't need to be here just to fill up ink on the paper. We need to do things that address the structural integrity because that's used when you renew your insurance, when people are getting loans, everything else. So here's a little checklist. Do so you have to complete a, a milestone? If your three or more habitable stories and your 32 years, then you are required to do the inspection by September 31st, 2024. If you are less than two stories or your one, two or three standard dwelling, then you're not required to complete a milestone report. What is the difference between phase one and phase two? Phase one is all a visual inspection. Phase two is a deeper investigation that recovers non-destructive or destructive testing. Some examples of things that we have done um, on our phase two investigations, a lot of stair problems, a lot of balcony problems as to be inspected. So as a firm, we don't wanna just have to say, oh, go and replace all your stairs because we need to help the community get through this first wave. The first five years is gonna be the hardest. Once we have five years of funding, things are gonna be much easier. People that have to move are gonna be moving. There's gonna be money in the bank and we're gonna be well on our way to a better life as managers and condos. So as a, we need to value engineer in any way possible to say that this makes sense. So a phase two necessarily isn't always a bad thing because it gives your engineer of record an understanding of what actually has to be done. So an example is we've had a lot of cut back, a lot of concrete by the stairs to see how bad the corrosion is. Because if there's a way to repair the stairs instead of replace the stairs, we wanna let you know that. Um, we've had to do water flow tests to kind of see how flat roofs are pitching and where the water's running does something need to be replaced or is there another uh, method that we can design we have to cut back um, some of the facade to see how much rot or deterioration is under so we can offer a plan instead of just saying you have to replace all of the outside if we can limit it to a certain scope so a phase two while you have to get your engineer involved and there is additional cost to that you don't want to always think about it as a bad thing because it gives you an opportunity to come up with a repair plan every firm does it a little bit differently by the time we're done with phase two you have a detailed specification that you can actually put out to bid so again that phase two is also helpful because it gives you something say what exactly do i have to repair you should shouldn't be done with the phase two and, and unclear at that time. So again, talking back to disclosures in terms of timelines, this is all about putting it out there so that everybody knows. This is the most important thing you managers have to walk away from because people are starting to get letters in the mail every single day. I was just on a call right before we started saying, hey, I got this letter 
And I thought we didn't have to do it to 2024, but Daytona Beach sent it to me saying they want us to do it by the end of the year. I said, okay, you have 14 days. Once you get that letter in the mail, as managers and as board members, you have 14 days to notify the owners. But how you have to notify them is very loose. It's not like you have to mail it to everybody. It says, if there is an email, go ahead and email it. Or if you want to post it on the website, if you have a website or stick it up in the lobby, just do something besides put it in a drawer and say, we're going to deal with this on, on November of 2024. That's what they don't want. They want it put out to the community. So people are talking about it. So there's pressure put on it. Um, once we get to the end of the law, typically within, um, let's say you get your letter next year, or the year after you have about 180 days from receiving that letter to go ahead and complete your phase one. And then after you do your phase one, you have 180 days to submit a plan of action of when you're going to fit, um, submit your phase two. So that doesn't mean you have to be done with it, but if you're done with the phase two, then you don't have to submit an action plan. So really you got six months to do the phase one, but then after you do the phase one, the board's not allowed to sit on that. You actually have to go ahead and make a plan to get your phase two done. Once the phase two is completed, you have one year to commence or start the work. Now imagine all the things that have to happen before you start the work. You know, we have to get the repair specifications. You have to put it out to bid. You have to get the financing. You have to do the assessment. You have to pass it with the board. There's a lot of decisions that need to be made. And you have to wait for your contractor to have the materials ordered and to be able to start. So I would highly suggest the second you're done with the phase two to start on an action plan because that year is just going to fly by. Um, lastly, the number to remember is you have 45 days after receiving a phase one or a phase two to go ahead and notify the ownership with those four ways that we talked about. So these are kind of some questions that we ask and I want you thinking. I don't know if we can, let me show the chat. Um, Valerie, you might want to kind of talk about that. Um, does anyone know, is this building require a milestone? I don't know if we see answers coming in. So at first, when you look at it, you would think, okay, this absolutely requires a milestone because it's over three stories, right? But now look how new it is. It's actually so new that it's a rendering. It hasn't even been built yet. <laughs> so the point is this would not require a milestone because it's over 30 years. We haven't really started talking about the SERS yet, but it would require a SERS if it was built. The next question is, we look at a building like this, would this require a milestone? And this is a little bit of a trick question as well, because this is one, two, three stories. So assuming that the city also recognizes this as three stories, this building on the left would require a milestone. But if this is the same community, do you then have to get a milestone with the building on the right? And a lot of people are asking us that question every day. And the answer is no, you're only required to complete a milestone on the three or more story structures. However, if Edith, as Travis was saying, lived over here, doesn't she wanna know that she's safe as well? So when we give a proposal, we give for the three stories and then you can add on the two stories at a, at a deal if you want it, but you don't have to do that as a board. You only have to do the three stories. So, okay, you're under 30 years old, but you're three stories, so you still have 30 years to wait, right? You're good? And the answer is no. Now comes the Structural Integrity Reserve Study. And there's been some debate on this. Um, I was originally reading the law the other way and maybe able to clarify it, but Travis has been involved heavily with the DBPR and the way the DBPR is ruling it out and the way that Senator Bradley intended it is that all buildings, regardless of age, um, re are required to do a structural integrity reserve study if you're three or more stories. And why is that? Because they want people to start saving now. They don't want you to wait. 
Um, so if your building is one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old, if you're over three stories tall, you must complete your structural integrity reserve study by the end of 2024. The biggest takeaway of that is, okay, I've got it done. When do I actually have to come up with the money? And the way it says is it says, paraphrased, any budget approved after 2024 must take into account the structural integrity reserve study. So in your budget meetings in 2025, you have to rule it out in 2026. So really it's fully funded in 2026, but fully funded, what does that mean? That means anywhere in that graph that talks about the next 30 years, you can never dip below zero. So if you are have to start a project in January of 2026, you have to have the money to fully fund that project and a plan for every month to collect money so that you'll never dip below zero. If you don't have to do a project according to the Structural Integrity Reserve Study until 2030, then you have four years as long as you have a funding plan in order to save up for that. So the earlier you get your Structural Integrity Reserve Study and the earlier you can see into the future about what you have to fund for, the, the more wiggle room that you have. It gives you time to get a loan. It gives you a time to maybe raise dues a little bit the next couple of years so you're not hitting everybody at 2026. So again, earlier the better because it gives you a vision into the future. So what the takeaways is, is SIRS is a study of funding, reviewing eight structural items, they changed it to eight instead of 10. Um, but it's really the same. Like everybody was up in arms. Foundations are in there. Well, if it was on a slab, we were putting foundations at zero dollars anyways. Um, I don't know what every reserve study company was doing, but this is all kind of semantics. Really, when you look at it and we look at these eight items right here, it's the things that are structurally holding up the item. But number eight says any item costs over $10,000 that affects or negatively affects the structural integrity as determined by the licensed architect or engineer should be in there. So if we go out and we see a problem with the foundation or a problem with the pilings, even though it's not listed in the eight things, it's gonna go on the report. If you have a pool that's in the on the eighth floor, above the pool deck, resealing of that pool is a major structural component because if that leaks, it could cause a surfside event. So it's all gonna be dependent upon the building, uh, how it's built and the condition of the building, the items that are in the structural integrity reserve study. So roof, load bearing walls, fire protection systems, um, which now we have a little bit of code issue because if you know that your building is going to have to come up to code for fire protection in 2027, then you really need to start funding for that now. So it doesn't say you have to turn around and be compliant, but the structural integrity reserve study is you have to come up with a plan to have the money. Electrical systems, waterproofing, um, and exterior painting, but really in Florida, you should never think about paint. You should always be thinking paint is your waterproofing. And then windows and doors. This is only for common areas. Um, they specified that in this law change. That's again, what we were doing anyways before that. So if you walk into the atrium and there's a big window above you, that's part of the association will be on the structural integrity. If you walk into your unit and open your sliding door, as long as your, your docs are written that way, which most people's are, that is not going to be part of the structural integrity. And, and then again, any items, Phil? And then, yeah, I was going to say on the electrical systems, this is becoming a bigger and bigger issue on the insurance side. It's something we've kind of been vocal about for the last few years, but I, I think folks underestimate how much of an impact it is, especially when the insurance market kind of tightens the way it has now. If your buildings were built prior to like the mid 70s and, and you have unprotected aluminum wiring or you have like stab lock breakers or federal Pacific panels uh, and each individual unit might, the building itself might, these electrical system uh, 
are, are major issues. Because for example, if you're one of these older buildings that are, are trying to get insurance and none of the current carriers will write you because of your age, one of the main areas you may go or main carriers you may go to is citizens if your agent knows how to rate with them and write with them. And it may potentially save a lot of money versus what the other options are and provide full coverage. The, the issue with going to citizens is they require these electrical inspection reports to be done uh, for every unit or building, depending on the scenario, for stuff older uh, than in that mid 70s and older. And so electrical systems are becoming a bigger and bigger issue to make sure that you have them updated, compliant, and, and to do what you need to do with that. I know from a structural perspective, it's not necessarily a super structural issue, but it is a, a big problem and something to, to make sure you have a plan for. Yeah, it's not a structural issue, but the legislature knew that this is a deterioration issue and they wanted to make sure that you're required to fund for it. Um, let's, and really what you need to think of, there's three buckets now. Before you had your operating and your reserve. Now you have your operating, your reserve, and your structural integrity. The structural integrity does not have to be straight lined. It can be pooled, but it can be pooled together, which is your best option for funding because it allows a, us a chance to kind of get into this and get the money allocated correctly. But it's protected because you can only use it for these items. So you can't have a board spending the money for waterproofing on a landscaping project or a signage. The other big takeaway that you have to understand is when you used to get your reserve studies, you would say, okay, can I have that on an Excel spreadsheet? And now the board's gonna go back and extend the useful life and take things off and make it the way they want to. That has gone away. You must follow what your reserve specialist comes up with. Bottom line, you cannot change it. You can get them to change it and work with them, but you have to follow it. You have to give that to the bank when you sell. And if you don't follow it, that's where the problems are. So who you choose to do your structural integrity reserve study is the most, in my mind, important decision that you're gonna make. I think it's more important than the milestone. It's more important than anything else because, and the cost of it shouldn't be your biggest factor. It has to be about who you're working with and if they can implement common sense procedures to get us through this first wave. Because if they write something and you don't like it, you have to fund it or you have to go out and buy another report. So they, you, the choice is no longer with the board. And this is a major fundamental change because every time we do a structural integrity reserve study and then it goes in front of the board, you always have that one person that says, I used to be an accountant. I'm gonna work with the numbers and make them better. No, you can't do that anymore. And then can I, before I have to jump, I'll, I wanna emphasize that because I feel like that's a big, big issue right now. So the, the new law prevents the boards, again, for three-story and, and taller buildings uh, that have this SIRS from waiving reserves, underfunding reserves. They have to follow this SIRS reserve schedule. I, I was always scared of the SIRS primarily because of what I felt like it may do uh, to, the, to the potential future reserves for associations. And we've seen some really crazy scenarios with, with, law, with um, engineering firms that went out and did these reports and just didn't do them kind of in like common sense fashion, like, like Tara mentioned, you can stick a board with some incredible catch up uh, from a, um, a reserve perspective, which can be backbreaking. I mean, you're just really stuck now. There's not a lot of flexibility in it, even if you disagree. So using a firm that understands the kind of big picture of what we're trying to get through with our boards, we, we get we have to comply, but we don't need to crush the association either. That's a really big piece of this because the SIRS is the scary part. The phase one, I think, was absolutely necessary and is important. And it's going to be big dollars for associations that have structural issues, but you got to fix that stuff. I mean, you can't not do that. The SIRS is where there's a lot more like, you know, just stuff that can occur that can totally, you know, ruin a situation from a cost perspective, if not done correctly. So I definitely believe what Tara's talking about there is huge for you guys to, to, to focus on. And so I apologize that I'm now leaving, but Tara's the, sh the, the, the shining star here anyway, and it is me to go over the rest of these items. I put my email address um, in the chat and any questions that get asked that I can't answer or didn't answer yet, I will do that in writing uh, back via email for anyone that needs it. So I apologize that I'm leaving now early too, but, but Tara's got this for sure. All right. So that's one question before you go from uh, sure. for you. So you had mentioned an old electrical panel. What was the name of that old electrical panel called specifically? 
So when when the insurance carriers mention like Federal Pacific panels, that's what they're they're old the old Federal Pacific. They were put in in the seventies, and they're just the there's potential fire hazards associated with them. And I know I've talked to plenty board members that have said I work for Con Edison and all this other stuff, and I know that this is not an issue or that's not an issue. And I'm not enough of an electrical engineer to understand it. I just know that the insurance carriers will have reinsurance issues with insuring that stuff, meaning the insurance carriers will promise the reinsurer that they're buying insurance from, that they are not insuring risks that have XYZ. So federal Pacific panels, unprotected aluminum wiring, whatever, stab lock breakers, whatever those deals might be, they're not allowed to insure them. So they're going to decline the risk because they it'll violate their reinsurance to, to try to insure that. Or they will put exclusions or warranties in the policy that will exclude losses that occur from that stuff. So it's it's dangerous to have it. And then you may have exclusions you don't realize you have, but that's why the carriers um, have that issue. And then Andy just mentioned on here, is there SIRS is required for two stories? And no, that is not the case. The SIRS is only for three-story or taller buildings that are that are in place right now as a, as a condo building. So the only ones that don't have to do it would be buildings that are being developed right now and they come out with the new, uh, which Tara will get into, but the, the turnover study, they don't have to get an SIRS for 10 years, but everybody else who's three stories or taller needs to get the SIRS. If you're two stories, you you, you do not. Uh, but I'll let Tara go from there with it. So thanks. Did that answer it? Am I good or anything yeah, else on it? Thank you, Phil. I appreciate it. Perfect. Well, thank you guys so much. And I'm sorry, again, I, I would stay here as long as I could with you guys, but um, anything else I will answer in writing. Thanks so much. Thank you. So um, at a minimum, the SERS must address the eight items. I don't know what happened to my PowerPoint here. It has to talk about the replacement cost um, and give you the ACV and it has to be fully funded by 2026. So the bottom line is there's no more waiving reserves for those eight items. We talked about the eight items. So our special sauce at Stone Building Solution is making complex ideas easy. We try to do that in reports and our reserve studies and we're gonna do it in this little table for you. So kind of to wrap your head around the differences, the SERS Structural Integrity Reserve Study is only required for three-story or more condos. Your traditional reserve study, you can use for all building types. There's no requirements. The SERS is really only in that bucket is for those eight specific items that we talked about. Your traditional reserve study, you can have structural or non-structural items. So um, it's, a SERS must be done by an engineer, an architect, or an RS. An RS is a designation given by CAI, which is reserve specialist. In order to get your RS designation, you need to have a degree in engineering, architecture, construction management, or similar work experience, have completed 30 reserve studies, and be in good ethical standing with um, the Board of Ethics. So right now, I believe when they passed this law, there was less than 300 of them in the United States. I think a lot more people are going to get that designation now that it's become um, important, but that's only to complete the visual inspection portion. Um, anyone can actually complete the reserve study. And the visual inspection portion is what gives the age and useful life. Um, for a traditional reserve study, I'm sorry, that's where anyone can inspect and anyone can write. So if you have a board member that used to be an accountant and he wants to do your reserve study, great. You can do the traditional reserve study, but for the structural integrity reserve study, you have to have an engineer, architect, or RS involved with that process. Um, the SERS funding is required. You are not allowed to waive it. For a traditional reserve study, there's no funding requirement. So you can still go ahead and with a membership vote, waive reserves um, for those traditional items. For a structural integrity reserve study, it's required by 2024 and then every 10 years thereafter. And a traditional reserve study is document specific. So, I've got my milestone inspection. I got my structural integrity inspection. Now what? We need to post it, give it to the building department, sleep easy, and make sure any budget that you approve after December 31st, 2024 um, does include for the structural integrity reserve study. 
This is the last major part that we want to go over. And this is about the teeth. This is about the banking. This is how it's going to get enforced. So you always, when a condo was being bought and sold, had to give your um, declarations, your bylaws, your articles and financial information, right? That's normal. That's disclosure. Now they're saying any condo sold, you need to provide a copy of the milestone inspection report or a statement of why you don't have it, a copy of the serves or a statement why you don't have it. If there was a builder, we didn't really talk about this, but there's also now something called a turnover report that's even gives a bigger, broader breakdown than the SERS does. If you have a turnover report, you need to give that if it's applicable. And you have to give this document frequently asked questions, which there's pages and pages and pages of information about the SERS and the milestone. Um, if you don't do that, this is really the teeth. It says a contract that does not conform with the requirements that we just talked about is voidable at the option of the purchaser prior to closing. So you can imagine that if someone thinks they're selling their condo for half a million dollars and they're there at the closing table and find out that it didn't comply or you didn't do your SERS or when you should have or your statement is invalid or that you have that you didn't disclose these things, they can void the contract sitting right there at the table. Then what's going to happen? They're going to come back and sue the board and sue the management company. And that's really where you're going to get your teeth. Just like we talked about insurance, banking, and politics. Insurance is going to mandate it when you go for your renewal. The law has already mandated it. And lastly, banks are going to require it to buy and sell units. Um, the last thing is that they talked about, and this was really for Phil, um, one of the changes in Senate Bill 154 is that if it exceeds 115% for assessment of last year, you can do it without a membership vote if it's for insurance premiums, which is very important. So guys, just to kind of make this come full circle, just weeks before the towers collapsed, the board president informed unit owners that they would soon need to pay high assessments because it had gotten significantly worse since 2018. But before that happened, 98 people could die. I always get emotional. I know somebody that was in there. It, that's what really, um, it's such a passion for us as a company to make sure this, this doesn't happen again and really to help associations through this time of change. It's only hard now. I always say it's like AI. Everybody's freaking out, thinking that robots are going to take over the world and what's going on with AI. It's a very scary thing. But in five years from now, we're going to even imagine a world before AI. It's going to be like a world before Google. So again, it's just coming through this time of unknown and change. And it's our job as professionals is to come up with as much value engineering, as much as a common sense approach on these serves as possible to make sure that the boards can make it through. But the bottom line is if you have your board members saying, well, Sally's retired and Sally just can't afford it. If Sally can't afford it, then Sally needs to move because the building has to be brought up. When you buy a unit, you're also buying, let's say there's 100 units, you're buying one one hundredth of the roof, one one hundredth of the pavement, one one hundredth of the paint. And if you can't pay for those things, then you can't live there anymore. And if the board doesn't want to be the bad guy, then they have to be willing to sacrifice the value of their own unit. Because the bottom line is if they don't do these things and don't make these hard decisions and don't spend this money, they're not going to be able to buy and sell their unit and the value of the whole community will significantly drop. Right on Easter weekend, I don't know if you saw it on the news, but um, there was a building in Miami that failed a recertification and the building was in such bad shape that they actually evacuated the building and the people had 48 hours to get out. So you can imagine waking up thinking your condo is worth a half a million dollars. And by the time you go to bed at night, your con how much are you going to sell your condo for if you have to evacuate? And you know, there's all these assessments. It's almost worth nothing. So getting ahead of these things um, is the best thing that you can do to keep the financial value of your unit. Last thing, are, is your community behind? Have you completed these? These are what we need to talk about. Milestone, the first one must be completed by 2024 and then every 10 years after, if you're 30 years old. 
SIRS, the first one must be completed by 2024 for all buildings three stories or more. That's a condominium um, and then required every 10 years after. You must have fully funding done by 2026. It has to be approved in 2025. Can, can be approved earlier, but you want to get that so you know what's ahead in the budget. And the traditional reserve study is based on your um, documents. And then lastly, insurance evaluation appraisals are necessary every 30 years. I'm sorry, every three years, excuse me. So let me get out of this. Stop share. Um, let's go to any questions and then we'll be wrapping up. Um, Valerie, we can actually, if people have questions or raise their hand, do you know we can make them? Um, yes, you, everyone has the ability live. to raise their hand. Uh, Christina, do you still have a question? Oh, I see that your hand was raised a few minutes ago. And Tara, you'll have to select them to be live. Let me see here. Um, so all attendees. Great. So Christina first, let me see, allow to talk. Go ahead, Christina, ask your question. So you're on mute, so we can't hear you if you're talking. Okay, I think we surprised her. Okay, so let's ask Katie Knoll. Katie, let's see here. Let's... Um, more disabled talking. Where did Katie go? I don't think she has a question any longer. She doesn't have a question. She doesn't want to talk. So if anyone raises their hand, then we can ask a question. And I don't see any hands raised. So maybe we don't have any. Oh, that was a mistake. Okay, Katie. Well, if anybody wants to get in touch with us, uh, my Valerie's email is Valerie, V-A-L-E-R-I-E -E, at stone, S-T-O-N-E, B-L-D-G dot com. You can go on our website, stonebuilding.com. And at the top, it says request a proposal. We can get a proposal out to you so that you can start kind of getting them on the boards. Or if you just want to talk through any of this, um, we'd love to talk about this kind of stuff and we're happy to help. Thank you so much, CAI, for having us today. Um, anything that we can do to help educate the boards, that's what we want to do. That's what CAI is all about. And this will be available um, on our YouTube channel for stone building as well, so you can watch it later. Here's Rainy. Thanks. Thank you so much for this very, very good information. Um, you know, to be honest with you, I just really didn't understand a lot of this. So this is great. And I'll try to get some of those slides from you so that we can share that with more people. And we'll have that as a resource to use. Thank you, Tara. Thank Jason, everybody, Dara, for answering questions. Thank you, Valerie. And you guys have a great day. Okay, I just wanted to say, Jason Martell, we had some technical difficulties with Martell and Ozum. Um, you can always reach out to them. Dare has been great to answer questions as well. Um, there was a question that we get a lot of was about funding reserves. And if you're moving reserves from your traditional account to the SERS, if your bylaws require a membership vote. We had talked about Jason on his opinion before he got cut off. Um, and his opinion was that, and he says it's the general consensus that he's seen going around Florida, that if it requires a membership vote until the law is specifically tweaked a little bit, you might have to do that. His suggestion was, if you can't get the vote, then just say, here you go, you're gonna get the vote or get the assessment because you do have the ability to assess for structural items. And then all of a sudden you might get the vote. All right, thanks everybody. We're gonna end this webinar and have a great day.